One really interesting thing I noticed, though, was that the team, the Kanmari team, also uses the Kanmari method to make business decisions. So, interesting. You know, if something feels like it doesn't really spark joy, they don't really hesitate in kind of, yeah, holding out for something that does. Welcome to Spark Joy, the podcast dedicated to celebrating the KonMari method and the transformative power of surrounding yourself with joy and letting go of all the rest. With your hosts and certified KonMari consultants, Kristen Ivey and Karen Sochi. And now, here's the show. Today's guest on Spark Joy is Jenny Ning. Karen and I met Jenny during our Kanmari consultant training days. So she was Marie Kondo's very first employee in the U.S. and helped grow the Kanmari brand from mid-2015 to end of 2016. So she was a resource and a friendly face to us. As emerging Kanmari consultants, we had many, many, many questions. So she helped us move toward certification after our three-day consultant training. So we relied heavily on her and she always greeted us with a smile and tons of joy. So we're very, very happy to have her on the show today. She's moved on from working for Marie Kondo and now she's practicing home organization on the side in San Francisco. And she continues to introduce people to the life-changing magic of the Kanmari method. So welcome to Spark Joy, Jenny. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here on your podcast. Welcome. We're so happy to have you. So my first question is, what led you to pick up the life-changing magic of tidying up? And what parts of the KonMari method resonated with you when you first read the book? Mm -hmm. um, well, so I had been trying for a while to declutter my apartment, um, but it wasn't really working. And I read an article in the New York Times. It was back in October 2014 when the book had just come out in the U.S. And I was so excited to read the book after reading the article that I went onto Amazon right away and just ordered the book immediately. And I really hoped that it would live up to its name because I needed something that was life-changing. And when I read it, there were points where I felt like Marie Kondo had just written the book especially for me. And I stuck color-coded tabs on so many of the pages, like, you know, a certain color for quotes, a certain color for categories, <laughs> for motivation. Yeah, it, it was... You the Kamari book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that's true. And I went around telling people that it was my Bible. And I actually, yeah. I remember telling everyone at um, Friendsgiving dinner about it that year. And I was so enthusiastic that... I think they just kind of thought I was just a little bit off. <laughs> they thought I was a little crazy. Yeah, I think a lot of us have experienced that with our families. Um, so what would you mm -hmm. say Kadmai has changed in your life or helped you get through some life transitions? Do you have any real life experience that you'd care to share? Yeah. Um, aside from the literal decluttering process, which it mm -hmm. definitely helped with, it really, um, it also helped me just step back and reevaluate my life. So up until then, I'd been doing kind of what I thought I should do in life. And, you know, for example, I studied finance and psychology in college, and I definitely loved psychology so much more. And um, when it came to, when it came time to look for a job senior year, I don't, I didn't really think about what I wanted. I just kind of adopted the herd mentality and went for all the finance roles that my other, my friends were also going for. And so, you know, seven years later, after trying a handful of different finance jobs, I was feeling really stuck and pretty uninspired. So the book really encouraged me to look at my life. And after I went through all my things to ask if my job sparked joy, and deep down, I didn't really need the book. I, I pretty much knew that it didn't spark joy. Yeah. But I think with the Kanmari philosophy, with that question, does it spark joy? You can't, you can't really avoid the answer. It's such a simple question that, you know, you just really have to admit it to yourself. So um, I ended up leaving my job five months after reading the book. 
great. Yeah. Yeah. I totally, um, that totally resonates with me because uh, I think there's something about this method that kind of uncovers. So it goes beyond tidying, right? So we kind of clutter in all areas of our life, right? So um, it helps us kind of clear out the objects and then makes room for us to kind of evaluate the other life goals that we may have or kind of get us unstuck from where we might be in, right. in certain aspects of our life. So thanks yeah. for sharing that. We, well, it sounds like you were a super fan, just like us, right? <laughs> yeah. And so we're really interested in, in, you know, how you made that shift to be, uh, by, you know, you we're super going from super fan to Kunmari first employee and mm-hmm. uh want to hear more about you know your role well we we know how you helped us but our listeners are probably curious on, on what you did as Marie Kondo's first employee yeah so I would say if I had to summarize how I got the job it was basically by kind of just being a crazy like a crazy fan kind of a stalker in a way <laughs> so um yeah one day a couple months after reading her book I was at work and I was texting a friend and she she had already heard, you know, this is my Bible and all that. And then I was joking about how I wanted to be Marie's personal assistant. And I was um, complaining about how I'd Googled so many times and I couldn't find her contact info online. Um, but then for some reason that day, I just decided to Google again. And I really couldn't believe it when I saw that she was speaking across the street from my office wow. that day at lunchtime. So I really don't think anything could have stopped me from going to her talk that day. (laughs) And I didn't have time to stay for the book signing, but I did rush up to her and I asked her translator to tell her, you know, I'll quit my job to work for you. So her translator conveyed the message and she just kind of smiled and giggled and said, oh, (laughs) like, I think just kind of like, okay, this is, you know, a super fan. That's nice. Um, but then I asked the translator if I could get her email address. And I think at that point, the translator felt like she had to protect Marie from me. So she said, no, <laughs> exciting is going to begin. Thanks. And yeah, I just couldn't let myself leave without getting something, you know, like some email or contact information. Uh-huh. So I actually saw her, um, like a re- representative from her Japanese publisher there, or I met him there and then I got his business card and I emailed him my resume and ideas that night, um, but he never responded. And ultimately, I quit my job. I took a trip to Japan since I'd always wanted to go. And before I left, I emailed again. He still didn't respond. But then I got an email from the Kanmari office saying that they were impressed by my enthusiasm <laughs> and that they'd be happy to meet with me. So. I really couldn't believe it, um, but yeah, I met with them in, to- in Tokyo a few times, and once I came back to San Francisco, I started volunteering for them, mm-hmm. so I took over social media posts, and I started posting in English. I worked on partnerships and scheduled talks for Marie, um, and I also answered a lot of the fans' emails through Facebook or yeah. um, just through the, the website. And I basically worked on whatever needed to be done in English. So it was it was a lot. And I thought about Kanmari 24-7. <laughs> and yeah, I really loved being able to help share the Kanmari philosophy. And about half a year later, I became an official employee. Wow, that is dedication and persistence there. Yes. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. And probably a little bit of tidying magic, right? We, we say yeah, thank you to our I items so. to attract t- positive energy and positive opportunities. So... That's awesome. So, so we're so interested in what goes on behind the scenes at uh, Kamari Media. Can you give us a glimpse of what it's like to be, you know, what it was like to be Marie Kondo's first employee and, you know, mm-hmm. any, any little fun facts you can share or <laughs> behind the scenes? About the day-to-day, <laughs> yeah, yeah. About like some of the day-to-day organizational kinds of things. I think we're all really interested to kind of know how everything comes together. Well, I think one key fact is that um, Marie and I actually didn't communicate that directly because of the language barrier. So, um, you know, there were only a couple people on her team who spoke English. And so I would 
normally go through them actually. Um, and I, yeah, looking back, I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity. It still seems kind of magical and I sometimes can't believe, you know, that it, it all happened. And it was really amazing because the fan base was already there and it was growing rapidly. So, you know, when I posted on Facebook, it wasn't like I had to scramble to get views or right. know, increase likes. I was tracking the likes every week and they were just increasing mm -hmm. um, steadily. And I could tell how passionate the people were about Kanmari. And so many companies were interested in working with Marie, like countless brands. They all wanted to collaborate on something related to, you know, minimalism and kind of mindfulness. Right. And so actually, I, th I feel like my job involved saying no a lot. And um, <laughs> one really interesting thing I noticed, though, was that the team, the Kamari team, also uses the Kamari method to make business decisions. So, interesting. you know, Very if something feels like it doesn't really spark joy, um, they, they don't really hesitate in kind of, yeah, holding out for something that does. That makes so much sense. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I know Karen and I tried to do that in our own lives as entrepreneurs mm -hmm. i think that's a great tip to you know mm -hmm. apply this method to your business decisions because right. um, it, it's so intuitive it's so about so much about you know gut decisions um mm -hmm. and what just feels right so um uh, that's a great tip Thanks for right but it's it's so interesting <laughs> I, I think it is really intuitive but it also goes so against kind of what we're taught mm -hmm. yeah like you have that, to analyze everything and yeah, yeah. And that, you know, working hard is suffering and, you know, giving up things that make you happy for the sake of, you know, your future success. So it's kind of a different really way than we're really taught, but mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense. And you can really see how it can be applied. And, and you know, in, in the case of most of us in, involved in the KonMari world, we really have been able to see it demonstrated that it really is a it's a much more pleasant pathway to our future you know whatever it might be mm -hmm. it's really interesting so now that you are in your new role as an organizer implementing KonMari as opposed to being an employee what was the the moment that you decided to shift from being a super fan to mm -hmm. a consultant how did you decide that you wanted to kind of embrace um, the consultant side of things. I played a big role in planning the first couple of Kunmari Consultant Seminars. Uh -huh. um, and I think during the planning, I just kept thinking, oh, I actually really want to attend this. And, you know, this looks like just, you know, the consultant job looks like it would be so much fun. And so I asked the team if I could participate and while I did have to run off sometimes and coordinate things, um, I'm, you know, I had the opportunity to go through the training myself, which I'm really grateful for. Um, it was really amazing to meet so many similarly obsessed people uh -huh. <laughs> like you two. And uh -huh. yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just feeling the energy of that really made me um, want to pursue it and to help people. Um, go through the journey just like I did. You know, it's interesting. Um, I have um, a little story to tell on you. I promise it's not embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> but I remember, I remember so well when we were doing a group exercise in San Francisco, and you mm -hmm. were kind of circulating around, you know, making sure that everyone was, you know, kind of yeah, had all their questions answered and kind of knew how to, to, to follow the group project around. And mm -hmm. you came over and said, something about that you really wanted to kind of sit with us and listen to what we were doing because it was so interesting. And I really got the sense that that, that because this was some, one of the first um, consultant trainings, that mm -hmm. you were not exactly sure how the process was going to look in action, <laughs> but there was something, I could just see it in your face that you were so captivated by what was happening from mm -hmm. the consultant side. Um, that you, you just, you found it as fascinating as we did. And it was just as 
new to you as it was to us because it was new to everyone. So you, I could yeah. definitely see that you, you know, you had that spark, you know, that you really saw it, um, it or you wanted to see it from a consultant's perspective. So it was really very neat. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed the seminars. I would say that's, um, or attending the seminars is one of the highlights of, you know, my memories of working for Kanmari. Right, right. So now what would you say sparks joy for you working with clients? Mm -hmm. I think that examining um, your relationship to things provides a lot of clarity about life. And so I, I like helping to guide clients through that and, um, you know, to, to see if they can stop and pay attention to whether the things in their, in their life align with their vision of what they, they wanted their life to be at that point. So yeah, I, re I really love being there, um, especially since I struggled through it myself and I you know, know how it feels and I know what the journey is like. So it's really rewarding to hear about afterwards about how um, their lives change after they get organized. Um, sometimes it's something you know as simple as just feeling more relaxed, um, which is really valuable in itself. But other times I've heard um, of some clients who have quit their jobs and some who have taken time off to travel. So yeah, it can cleaning your home or t organizing your home can definitely lead to a lot more. Awesome. So, so we're, so I'm here in the Midwest and Karen's on the East coast. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about what it's like being a consultant on the West coast. What kind of um, specific clutter challenges or clutter challenges are specific to the Bay area or in San Francisco? One that comes to mind um, because rent is notoriously high here is mm -hmm. that people's homes are pretty small usually. Um, and since even, you know, an average amount of possessions can make a, a tiny space feel cluttered and chaotic, I think a common clutter challenge here is that people can feel overwhelmed pretty easily. And so they really need to ask themselves if they're willing to let things go in order to feel better. And yeah, there's, there's usually no spare room to stash things in. Um, mm -hmm. There's not really like a giant closet that you can just put all your seasonal stuff in and not really ever open unless you need them. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say that's, that's something I've seen a lot. Right, right. So now that you've been living the KonMai life for a while now, what would you say, and as a consultant and as a a fellow traveler, what would you say is your favorite tidying tip? I have two, and one is a Kanmari tip, and one is, um, I guess, a non Kanmari minimalist tip. Okay. So the first one um, is uh, what she says in her book. It's a quote the quote, um, sometime means never. And that has been really useful to both my clients and myself. I think it's a good reality check. It makes you accept who you are right now, not who you think you'll be or who you wished you were. Um, and you have to think about what suits your current lifestyle. So I think that really encourages self-acceptance. And um, a non kanmari tip, I, I think it's an idea from the minimal, minimalists it's the 2020 rule. Have you heard of it? No. No, tell us more. So the rule says that, um, oh, so you apply this rule to like just in case items. And the rule says that if you can replace something within 20 minutes for $20 or less, then you can give yourself permission to let it go. And oh, I that's think, great. yeah. And I think like for, for people in San Francisco, especially with small spaces, and we have all these apps where we can get something almost immediately. Um, I think this is really useful and it helps to frame things differently. Right, right. That's really great. And you made me think because I, I live in, in a big city also and, and mm -hmm. size is really um, a big, is a, a, a rare commodity. And right. I, 
in New York, it seems like a lot of folks have storage lockers that are outside of their apartment that they pay per month for. And one of the things I've discovered as a consultant is that a lot of people, a lot of folks keep things in their storage locker that could be replaced for $20. And mm -hmm. they're paying more to store the item than the item is actually worth. So mm -hmm. it's just exactly what you said, that if they got rid of it and just bought it again if they needed it, they would mm -hmm. probably come out ahead. So that's really a great tip. I like that a lot. Yeah, I would say yeah. one of my favorite texts from a client was a picture of her final statement for her storage locker that she ended up not needing anymore. Wow. And, and, uh, I was wow. so proud of her because she really was just keeping things in there. And when you add up those bills, it just doesn't make financial sense right, you know, most right. of the time. That's mm -hmm. great. So Jenny, what what is next for you? What what are you working on now? Where, where is your passion these days? Um, yeah, so after uh, I stopped working for Kanmari, I thought about what sparks the most joy for me um, or, you know, what's what's really meaningful to me in life. And two of the things would be family and helping others. And um, I've also realized that creating something is important to me and improving the status quo is also important. So I just, you know, kept thinking about those things. And um, I'm currently working on a startup that's called Tummy Mom. It's a, it's a surrogacy network and it connects... Um, gestational surrogates, people who want to be parents, and agencies. Um, so many couples struggle with infertility or, like in the case of gay couples, they simply can't carry a baby on their own. And finding a surrogate match can often be really expensive or time-consuming. So the goal of my company, Tummy Mom, is to make the matching process less stressful um, and also very affordable. Wow, that's great. That's so interesting. And I love the name. <laughs> oh, thanks. That's darling. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Well, we wish you so much luck. And uh, we want to ask you if the, you have any final tidying words of wisdom you'd like to share with our listeners. Um, yeah, I so I've read the Kanmari books, Spark Joy and The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up countless times. And one of my favorite quotes is the one that says, life truly begins only after you have put your house in order. And a fun fact that I discovered is that this is the last sentence of the first book, and it's the first sentence of Spark Joy, the second book. Wow. And awesome. yeah, I, so I feel like that sentence really sums it up. And um, for people who are in the journey or thinking about beginning, I think it's definitely something to look forward to. That was great. Thanks great. for sharing. And we want to thank you also for joining us here at Spark Joy. It was great having you here, Jenny. Thank you so thank much. You. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for being with us. We really enjoyed it. And to connect with Jenny, you can visit her website, JennyNing.com, or follow her on Instagram at Jenny Organizes. So now we want to hear from you. Tell us your burning, tidying questions or share stories about how Kanmari has impacted your life. You can find us at www.sparkjoypodcast.com and click Ask Spark Joy to leave a question or comment for a chance to be featured on next week's show. You can also join the discussion on Facebook or on Twitter at, at @sparkjoypodcast. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope your day sparks joy. Thank you for listening to Spark Joy with your host, Kristen Ivey of For the Love of Tidy in Chicago and Karen Sochi of The Serene Home in New York City. Spark Joy, the podcast is not endorsed by or affiliated with Conmari Media Incorporated. The opinions expressed on this episode represent the views of the co-hosts and guests alone and do not represent the corporate position of Conmari Media Incorporated or the Conmari Consultant Community.